The next major NASA human spaceflight project is the Space Shuttle. The Space Shuttle was designed with the purpose of resupplying both crew and cargo for space stations. So we're going to look at a very brief uh, history of space stations. Looking at page 20 of your notebook. We start up here in the late 19th century with the U.S. writer Edward Everett Hale. Hale wrote a science fiction tale where in this uh, story he talked about a manned satellite that was used as a navigational aid. And so we have the beginnings of possibly the thought process of GPS, Global Positioning System, and uh, Hale's manned satellite. So it was a manned satellite, so a kind of crossover between potential thought of space stations with uh, purpose being for uh, global positioning. This image from that Atlantic Monthly story. This gentleman might look familiar to you. It is the uh, great Romanian rocket scientist uh, Herman Obert. He's the one that gave us the term space station in his writings. And in 1928, Herman Poltenik, who is a Yugoslavian, he uh, wrote underneath under the pen name, the pseudonym of Nordung. He actually gave us the first images of uh, thought processes of building a space station. And Google Doodle in the European region on December 22nd, 2012, did a little honor of the 120th time that Potnik's DNA went around the sun. And of course, we can't mention the ability to travel to a space station without, of course, recognizing that it was Dr. Robert Goddard who got the world to realize a little bit later than he would have hoped to realize that we can actually travel in space. We don't need a vacuum to push against. We just capitalize on Newton's third laws. Third law. Here we have a uh, look at the great Dr. Werner von Braun. And not only was he interested in getting to the moon, he was uh, very much interested in the uh, beginnings of space stations as well. And he described a wheel-shaped space station reached by reusable wing spacecraft. So the thought process of what we know now to be a space station, early on conceived by Dr. von Braun. And uh, clear back in 1952, the idea of a spinning space station to create some artificial gravity in terms of the ability to walk around, because you are under the influence of gravity as a space station. That's what's bringing you to fall about the Earth. But the engines and the motors maintain your altitude of about 150, 200 kilometers above the Earth so that you don't go crashing into the Earth or flying off into space. As we've already discussed in the class, space stations were seen as the next step after humans reached orbit, and that is where the Soviet Union spent most of their focus, as initially did the U.S. In 1959, NASA recommended a space station be established before a trip to the moon. Study what it's like, even if it's possible, for a human to send, spend a sustained amount of time in space. The U.S. House of Representatives Space Committee declared a space station a logical follow-up to the Project Mercury. Then Kennedy reviewed many options for response to prove the U.S. would not yield space to the Soviets. And uh, we looked at those options earlier in the course. In 1964, seeds were planted for Skylab, a post-Apollo first-generation space station. And by 68, a space station was NASA's leading candidate for a post-Apollo goal. 1969, the year Apollo 11 landed on the moon, NASA proposed a 100-person permanent space station with assembly completion scheduled for 1975. Uh, spoiler alert, this didn't happen. The name of the station you might like is called Space Base. It was to be a lab for scientific and industrial experiments. And it was envisioned to be a home port for a nuclear-powered type of tug that was designed to carry people and supplies to an outpost on the moon. 
NASA realized the cost of shipping supplies to a space station using expendable rockets, so those that couldn't be reused, would quickly exceed the station's construction costs. So not very economical at all. And NASA also foresaw the need to be able to return things from a space station. I mean, particularly the physical results of scientific experiments. Equipment that needed to be reused. Uh, during your Apollo era here, a reusable spacecraft was the obvious solution, and in 68, NASA first called such a spacecraft a space shuttle, and then the name stuck. So this was your thought process of space base, uh, nuclear tugs here, and uh, the early, early, early thought of a reusable space plane, space shuttle. A uh, little successful moment here to put into perspective for ourselves is that uh, this 22-day stay in space by living creatures in February 1966 uh, was not a record surpassed by humans until 1971 with the Soyuz 11. And we'll look more at what this is and what it means. So there was quite a long time before we spent uh, up to a month in space in our early space day histories. So I uh, mentioned previously in class that the Salyut was the very first space station and this is the uh, patch for that. Now Salyut means salute or fireworks and here's the Salyut space station. This vehicle over here is the Soyuz. This is the old standby Soviet, now Russian, vehicle that uh, members will travel to space in. If you take a quick look at, jump to page 45 in your notebook, these three rockets here for the Soviet Union and now Russia, these three rockets right here are just the old faithfuls, quite literally. This is the early uh, top of the rocket system that would take your Vostok vehicles like Yuri Gagarin, Sputniks. Then they went to the Voskhods when we had uh, multi-crew systems. And then we've had the Soyuz, probably the most dependable and reliable spacecraft of all time. And the main rocket setup for the Soviet uh, space program and now Russian space program is if they're going to be sending cargo, this capsule is the progress vehicle. And then for manned crewed missions, this is the setup for atop the proton rockets here. And as they keep mentioning, the Soyuz, an incredible vehicle. Uh, they do make improvements, obviously, as we learn more throughout our exploration of space. But the overall model from clear back with the uh, first launch of its configuration in 1967 all the way to present uh, is just a remarkable vehicle with immeasurable, nearly seemingly in our mind, amount of success. And then if you're not going to have crewed members, usually three, then this is what's used to send uh, supplies for the space station in these progress uh, vehicles. Here's a look from a satellite of the Salyut spacecraft. And a little bit better image from another satellite of the world's first space station, the Salyut. And a diagram showing you how you could re-supply uh, and change out crew of the Salyut. And these were the quarters and the place where they would run scientific exper experiments. So Salyut, uh, April 1971. Very first decade anniversary of the launch of the first human to travel to space. Look at the Earth below and come back safely and tell humanity about it. Yuri Gagarin. So the space station Salyut arrives and then a few days later, making sure you, of course, that the space station is in orbit, is sustainable. Then the Soyuz 10 spacecraft carries the first crew to visit Salyut 1. And unfortunately, the crew isn't able to dock successfully. Again, pointing out how difficult rendezvous in space are, hence the very much overlooked importance of Gemini in the NASA side of things. 
On the 7th of June, the Soyuz 11 crew successfully docks and stays aboard, not abort, Salyut until 29th of June. So this is the first crew that surpasses our cute little puppies back in 1966. However, the mission ends in utter tragedy when all three die after capsule cabin pressure fails during their re-entry. So they separate from the Salyut space station and there is a mechanical malfunction with a valve to pressurize the cabin and unfortunately the Soviet space program loses the lives of the great space explorers Patsyev, Drabolsky, and Volkov. And here's some footage of them while they were aboard the space station. Very sobering is to look at some of the material from the uh, the uh, recovered articles from the Salyut space station uh, that uh, arrived to Earth. And we have uh, a doll that one of these uh, cosmonauts had taken aboard to give to um, his kid to play with that, uh, hey, this was a doll that uh, spent nearly a month in space. And their navigation system, the celestial sphere here. These are on display in the Smithsonian in the U.S. It's a bad picture and blurry because I took it pre-iPhone era. At least that's what I used to blame. So our U.S. space efforts into the space station world, we have Skylab. In May of 1973, the U.S. launches the Skylab space station atop a Saturn V rocket, very similar to those which took astronauts to the moon. So here's one of the early sketches of the uh, adaptation that they would make to a Saturn V and turn into a Saturn II. And uh, this is an actual sketch by Dr. Werner von Braun. And here's a picture you've seen before. We have Dr. Von Braun here. And then this is George Mueller, uh, Mueller who is the f considered father of the space shuttle. And you can see a sketch by George Mueller here of how we could um, adapt the uh, Skylab space station and make it into a long-term duration space adventure. Page 8 of your notebook, this is an image we've shown you before, but now it makes a tiny bit more sense to you, in that we have these models, and this is the Saturn V, of course you know the world's largest rocket, and then these two right here are your Saturns that were modified to take the space station and space station crew to Skylab. And the wonderful launch of Skylab, so you see it's a tiny bit shorter than the Saturn V, and the Skylab is in this modified uh, command and service module area. And that was the uh, place I showed you where that uh, workshop Skylab living quarters would be for three person crews. And those three crews, that would be three three-person crews we'd be having. The goal was to stay for 28, 56, and then 84 days. So a month, a couple months, a couple more months for each stay. Think about if you were to be assigned to a Skylab crew, would you want to be the first one? See what it's like to spend nearly a month in space? The two-month crew or the longest crew for the space station U.S. at that time? And here's a sketch of the Skylab, so very vertical in thinking, that you had these different um, areas in which to work, to eat, to sleep. Exterior view of the space station. One of the greatest uh, scientific instruments we had was this Apollo telescope mount, an app as Apollo. And we have... Uh, the old familiar command service module. This would be an extra area for uh, storage uh, materials if need be. This is an early, early concept map of the Skylab space station. And then we get our first crew. So we have the Skylab launch successfully and our first crew to take uh, residence. Three names you want to jot down in our lovely 70s 
brown, tan, orangey uh, spacesuits. I'm told it's very 70s. You have astronauts Kerwin, Conrad, and Weitz, or Weitz. Conrad was your commander, Weitz the pilot, and you had Kerwin as the science pilot. And uh, we have ourselves Skylab 1, which sometimes it's called Skylab 2 in that it was the second launch of a Skylab program, but Skylab 1 was the first one that was a manned mission. And the patch, if you had a lovely Lion Brothers patch, they would stitch the initials of the astronauts, the CKW, for the astronaut surnames. And this is the painting that was the inspiration for the Skylight Patch. The painting was by uh, Frank Fries. And that made its way into the patch. And we're going to play this wonderful game of can you spot the difference. And it's not about the coloration between these two patches. But there is something quite different about the two. Spot the knots. Hmm. See anything? Here, the solar array panels in the X formation are behind the solar array panels. And in the addition here, the X solar array panels are in front. I know it's obsessive. And here is a look at the space station of Skylab. And you may notice something missing over here. And we'll turn it over to the Modern Marvels, a section from the Modern Marvels uh, documentary about Skylab to give you the history of uh, what happened here and how do we fix that. And here is that uh, only major surviving piece of Skylab fragment that uh, touched down in Australia. And the uh, funny story behind the U.S. getting this fragment back is a radio show hosted a competition. And the competition was to uh, essentially try and get NASA to pay the... Um, littering fine to have the piece returned and uh, the U.S. did end up paying the littering fine. I can't remember how many hundreds of dollars it was or if it was Australian or U.S. dollars. I, for some reason in my head I'm thinking it was like 400 but uh, the Skylab fragment is now on display uh, for folks to see and in the Seattle Air and Space Museum. We have a cassette tape, a mixed tape that was taken by Pete Conrad aboard the space station of Skylab for some in-flight entertainment. And of course, the, lots of information being gathered about the medical side of space flight. Uh, how would the human body react to enduring in space for extended periods of time? Space station uh, real estate is very, very uh, much a luxury, and so didn't even really have space to sit down and have their meals. And so here's Skylab Crew 1. After Skylab Crew 1, we have Skylab 2, which is sometimes referred to as Skylab 3, which is kind of a uh, misunderstanding in the numbering system. So the third Skylab launch, second Skylab uh, manned crew, and the image for the central figure of the patch is a shout out, of course, to the world of the uh, Da Vinci Measure of a Man image. The three crew member names you want to jot down are Garriott, Lusma, and Bean. Bean is one of the 12 humans that walked on the moon during the Apollo program. If you happen to have a Lion Brothers patch of the Skylab 2 crew, 
you'll have stitched in this area over here the B, the G, and the L for the three crewmen. These gentlemen were going to be aboard the space station for about two months. And so the uh, astronaut wives of being Gary and Lusma decided that they should have their own endurance uh, patch made for themselves. And so there's the wives patch and their first names right here. Otherwise the patch would look very much like that one. And they just want to distinguish theirs a little bit more. And uh, this you might think is uh, in honor of Soviet Union or something. This is actually to represent the sun as lots of solar investigations being done of the Skylab. And the main patch for the Skylab program is um, honoring a solar eclipse. And of course, it's all about repurposing. And this is the Apollo command service module that was used to dock and then they could transfer into the Skylab. It's a vertical look down through the Skylab. It's actually two members from Skylab 3, but it's a great shot of that um, space they had to work in. And early testing going on for future uh, use of a possible jetpack for EVAs. EVAs for Skylab were definitely a tethered, but they were investigating in NASA, as you see back here. They were trying, and this is astronaut Bean, uh, trying to think of ways that they could make EVAs a little bit easier in terms of maneuverability around things without that tether, but maybe not easier in terms of recovering an astronaut if something failed with the manned maneuvering pack. And here we have Arabella, one of the spider participants in research aboard Skylab. There are several of these uh, spiders used and uh, basically trying to see if spiders are able to generate their web designs in a weightless environment as well as they can on Earth. I would definitely call that success. Too bad we can't interview Arabella. Say, hey, what, what were your thoughts when you started spinning today's web for the first time in a weightless environment? You can't emphasize enough how space is of a premium within the space stations. So food was sent up with uh, the ability to be rehydrated. And so this would be the container for your drink of orange juice before and then the astronaut would take and add water. And of course, they'd extend this plastic column up and add the water, shake it up, and then they could consume that. And then when they were done, they could shrink it back down so that their space for garbage was um, maximized as well. So a sink mechanism aboard the Skylab where the water would be infused. And this is a delicious, oh my goodness, doesn't that look appetizing? Typical Skylab meal. And here's astronaut Garriott chowing down on deliciousness. It's always awesome to think about how the uh, footage was captured back in the day. This is astronaut White uh, changing out the film reels, uh, recording not so much the footage of them, but the data of the mission itself, the computer data. And you have to maintain your body mass and muscle mass as much as you can in a weightless environment. So exercise essential. And then the shower. So this could actually be closed up in this area right here. And in the weightless environment, they found that actually it wasn't really necessary to enclose yourself in a large um, shower cocoon as the water would pretty much stay in its droplet form and would, through the surface tension, adhere to washcloths and to the body. So this wasn't needed to protect any um, loose water causing any potential damage into the station. There's uh, astronaut Conrad. I don't know if that's a shower cap, but maybe not now. This is a washcloth here. 
Velcro and astronauts are best friends, so things don't just uh, float away and get away from them in a weightless environment. Uh, brushing your teeth in space, kind of a fun experience in that uh, what they would do is apply the toothpaste brush and in a Earth 1G environment, we get the little downward gravity assist when we want to spit the toothpaste and uh, dirty saliva out. So what they would do in the space station is use a washcloth and they would spit into the disposable washcloth or a tissue. That, of course, has been improved upon, and we now have toothpaste that is one-time use that can actually be safely swallowed by astronauts. And like so many things in the space program, they become consumer spin-offs, and we're able to go to your local box store and buy this toothpaste first developed for long stays in space. The electric shaver was a great addition to the space station hygiene kits as the whiskey whiskers could be captured rather than uh, straight razors letting loose whiskers fly in a weightless environment. This is the way they would uh, cut each other's hair, so just a vacuum that would uh, take in the loose hairs. This was then taken into a commercial product uh, called the Floby which uh, kind of tried to standardize haircuts at the home. Uh, it was pretty popular, I think it was the early 1980s, but uh, then people uh, went back to salons and barbers for their haircuts. But uh, the flow be inspired by the space station. And as scientists, you should demand evidence. So here's... Your Floby. Before the Floby, only a skilled professional could produce a good layered haircut. Tens of thousands have been sold to satisfied customers. Why? Because it really works. Proper suction is the key to getting great looking haircuts with no cleanup. Loving the music. This ingenious device lets you give yourself and family perfect haircuts every time. Tens of thousands have been sold to satisfied customers. Why? Because it really works. There you go. Sleeping quarters. Now in a weightless environment, your head and hands can end up free floating. So sometimes it's easier for the astronauts to kind of strap their head and arms down in place to get a more Earth-like type of a slumber. And uh, a lot of people think that it's just as an astronaut life, you go aboard, have fun, and come back down, talk about all the great antics and fun time you had in space. NASA actually allocates every single moment of your time. They dictate when you will sleep and when you will wake up. We mentioned in Gemini, the beginning of the tradition of the wake-up calls for mission control. They tell you when to eat, what to eat. All of that is pre-planned on Earth and the amount of time for you to uh, conduct your personal hygiene. A little bit of recreation time in there, as that is vital to uh, survival anywhere. Conducting scientific endeavors and research. And then, of course, maintaining the ship and uh, the orbit of the ship, uh, maintenance of uh, materials, etc. And part of their dinner times would be broadcasting from space to the uh, world audience that would be interested in hearing about life aboard the space station. So here are the crew of uh, Bean, Garriott, and Lusma doing one of those uh, mini uh, media presentations. And it's always fun to play leapfrog in a weightless environment and the leisure time. You gotta love the way in which you can travel. And the crew of Skylab 2 were very much into their entertainment and a little tricksters. They decided it would be fun to leave these little souvenirs for the incoming Skylab 3 crew uh, to open up Skylab and find. I think that'd be a little terrifying, not as funny, but uh, they even had them rigged up with the Skylab 3 patch for the upcoming Skylab 3 crew to encounter. That's funny, not funny. 
So the Skylab 3 crew here with their patch. And the crew here names you want to jot down are Carr, Gibson, and Pogue. They stayed for 84 days in space. Carr, Gibson, and Pogue. You see the three in the patch here. If you have a Lion's Brother patch from the era, you'll see in the tree a G, a C, and a P. And we do actually have on the patch wall in the classroom one of the Lion's Brother patches for Skylab 3. It's uh, more towards the south side of the wall with the Skylab mission patches. And then there were some uh, additions that had this uh, comet on the patch. One of the things that Skylab 3 was going to be able to investigate in the best possible viewing position from those of us on Earth was the Comet Kahootek. And here is an image of Comet Kahootek here. And this is the Apollo Space Telescope Mount System that was used to capture this image of uh, Comet Kahootek. And this is actually Dr. Lubos Kahootek, who was the discoverer of the comet. And he was able to talk to the Skylab crew uh, during the time in which they captured an image of the comet that he was able to discover. Pretty unique opportunity. Here we have astronaut Carr trying out some updated modifications, things that were learned in the previous Skylab missions to adjust and continue the testing of this uh, mobile manned maneuvering unit. And some wonderful shots of Skylab uh, crew once again. This one is astronaut Gibson. And this one astronaut Carr. And uh, here, Carr is able to balance Pogue on one finger, one of the joys of your uh, weightless environment in a space station free-falling about the Earth. Now, Skylab wasn't designed for resupply or refueling or an independent reboost, meaning its own vehicle mechanism was in play to maintain a higher orbit, or as the uh, Skylab spacecraft began to decay its orbit, decaying not like rusting or decomposing, but uh, falling closer to the Earth, not in danger territory, but not maintaining the altitude sufficient to continue to make those laps around the Earth and maintain in a weightless environment. And so uh, when the last Skylab crew headed home in February 1974, NASA thought about taking that space shuttle and use it to boost the Skylab into that higher orbit and maybe even then refurbish and reuse that space station. So there was this planned concept to use the shuttle to create a uh, boost mechanism but as I'm sure you can predict, uh, greater than expected solar activity expanded Earth's atmosphere, hastening Skylab's fall from orbit and shuttle development. This is what I figured you could predict fell behind schedule. So Skylab re-entered Earth's atmosphere in July of 1979, as you know, broke apart, except for that one piece uh, in Australia. So it spent a total of six years orbiting our planet for just under 35,000 orbits. Some of the highlights of the missions were the fact that the astronauts and scientists alike enjoyed student experiments. So the idea where students would suggest uh, exploring a particular topic. So uh, not necessarily a student experiment, but things that we could turn into educational materials for uh, education purposes upon their return. Why don't you take a moment and sketch out uh, what you think a candle flame in a weightless environment aboard a space station would look like. So if I take a candle, hold it parallel to the ground, my flame is upwards like this. Take a moment and sketch, grab a piece of paper and uh, back of a learning log, uh, somewhere in your notebook, whatever you might have uh, handy. Sketch what you think a candle flame would look like in a weightless environment. And here's a candle flame in microgravity. 
Now microgravity is a term NASA uses that was initially conceived to try and get people to stop thinking of being in space and floating around your cabin as in zero G because there absolutely is gravity. Experiment or astronauts experience just about the same amount of gravitational attraction from uh, the Earth's core as we do walking on the planet. It is slightly less, but they're still under that influence. That's what ab is able to keep that space station orbit around the Earth as it free falls about the Earth. Because they are falling about the Earth, they're weightless, and anything that is falling has a weight of zero. So the term microgravity was supposed to uh, imply that there's just a tiny, there's a micro, there's a little difference in the gravity the astronauts are experiencing compared to when they're on Earth. However, general news media has kind of turned into more of meaning close to zero gravity, meaning they're in a very little gravity environment. And uh, it's just a term that has uh, stuck of microgravity uh, meaning that there's not very much gravity when there actually is. Alrighty, here we have some bubbles being produced in a 1G Earth environment. And here's what they would look like in a weightless environment. More or less one giant bubble. A few over here. So the student experiments is something that was a highlight of the Skylab missions and something that has continued through the space shuttle program. And the astronauts very much uh, thought windows would be something to include on future space stations. Now, of course, Skylab wasn't originally designed in terms of space station um, optimum uh, design. It was taking what we already had, these Saturn V's that were going to be used back for Apollo 18, 19, and 20, and modifying them so that uh, they could have a space station. So windows weren't an initial thought with the Skylab, and it's certainly something that the Skylab astronauts advocated for in future space stations. Now with the windows that they, limited the windows that they did have, we have some nice pictures of Earth. What a great country you're looking at here. Of course, you're looking at the wonderful country of Wales. More closer to home here in the Utah. This is an image of the Great Salt Lake. Bonneville Salt Flats. So these are the nine individuals who were the folks that uh, were part of the Skylab program for the United States. 50th anniversary, they did a commemorative patch, and we have here the prime crews, and then underneath those were the uh, people who trained as uh, the backup crews for these Skylab missions. There is a mock-up of the Skylab in the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. This picture must have been taken uh, during hours of closed operation, as any time I've been to the Air and Space Museum, there is quite the line to do a quick walkthrough and see the interior of what the Skylab space station looked like. The Skylab space program brought us to 12,351 hours in space at this time for the U.S., NASA decided to defer, delay, plans for a permanent space station until after the space shuttle was flying and explored international cooperative space project as a means of filling in for a permanent station. Now keep in mind when we say permanent space station, we generally are thinking in terms of years 5 to 10 for it being in space. We don't necessarily mean permanent as in it, this space station will be in space for an infinite amount of time. Permanent in space explorations for space stations about five to ten years. So looking and reaching out to uh, allies for uh, participation in this space, space station program, Europe was invited to participate in the post-Apollo programs in 1969 and they formally agreed to supply NASA with space lab modules. There used to be many labs that would ride in the shuttle's payload bay in uh, 1973 is when they agreed to this. So this would be a space lab module. 
So, of course, the doors removed for the graphic here. So this would be the space lab where the science investigations could be done and your astronauts could travel in and out here. And a little closer look here. So the uh, facilities that uh, are available during a space station, uh, or excuse me, space shuttle mission, and like a mini space station within the payload area of the shuttle. And that was uh, the European agreement to contribute to this uh, more permanent human presence in space.